Good morning, good evening, wherever you are in the world. We are in the south of Atlanta, Georgia, in the good old U.S. of A. We are in God's grace, what we call a clearinghouse for truth seekers, finders all over the world. And you can find us on focusonthekingdom.org. Our ministry name is Restoration Fellowship, founded by Sir Anthony Buzzard. Sometimes we're asked what uh, we do with your generous help and donations. Well, we do uh, what we can, like most of you out there. We have a monthly magazine, just go to the links and September's magazine should be out today, by the way, is September 11, 2022, a rather somber day here in the US. A lot of people observing the events of uh, what, what what was 21 years ago now, a great uh, tragedy, terrorist attack. We have a podcast that I uh, upload and um, <clears throat> every other week or so I, I uh, update it. So check that out. We have the conference we have every spring, every year. So next year, uh, soon, I guess we'll be uh, telling you the exact dates for that. We will do it online again. And we have various websites, humanjesus.org, Christ Enemy Love, and Jesus Kingdom Gospel, which I have updated with new articles. JesusKingdomGospel.com, you can see there some articles there. And also on the Human Jesus, I have updated with some new articles today so okay so we continue in the book of jeremiah before we do that we usually start with prayer and then a youth lesson this sunday will be from tracy z of kog missions but before we do all that, Anthony will tell us about the Shema and uh, we will pray for this dark world and uh, prayers for our health and our little church here in Atlanta, Georgia. Thinking of the Warrens, the Warrens family, the Cox family, and others who may be undergoing various travails, trials, and tribulations. Good morning, Anthony. Okay, Carlos, thank you for that introduction. Sets the stage, I think, for what we want to do. Resurrection Sunday by resurrection. We know the resurrection was on Sunday, crucifixion on Friday, because Luke 24, 21 says, today, Sunday, is the third day since the crucifixion. So no problem with that. That's amazing that Jesus is not dead. He's alive as of that resurrection Sunday. And my task this morning, is to remind you of the most important commandment of all. Jesus said, in answer to a question from a friendly Jew, who asked, what is the supremely important commandment, the one you must not on any occurrence, on any occasion get wrong? And Jesus answered by reciting the Shema, which in Hebrew sounds like this, Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad. That word echad means one. It means one, not two, not three. One single, only one. Nobody except one is God. That's very Jewish. That sounds like Jesus. So why wouldn't we want to follow Jesus by following the creed of Jesus? I put that to you this morning as we do week by week and ask you to think about that profoundly and deeply. Okay, with that in mind, I would ask you to look up to heaven or to bow your head, whatever is your particular custom and we'll ask God to be with us through his spirit for these uh, next moments for an hour and a half or so. Our Father in heaven we thank you for giving us this miracle of technology in a world that is so dark and dim and sad in so many ways as we think this particular particular date of the catastrophe that happened 21 years ago we do pray that in view of the anarchy and the chaos and the difficulties that the world's encountering, it should cause your kingdom to come. As Jesus prayed, we're to pray, may your kingdom 
come soon to put an end to the chaos and confusion to bless the world on a scale that's never been seen yet. We ask you now for your operational presence and power, the spirit of Jesus infused into the words that we speak as we try to make sense of these chapters in Jeremiah. Guide us, guard us, watch over what we do, inspire the questions and, and comments we have from our good audience. Bless the so-called young person's lesson coming very shortly. Strengthen us now for the work that lies ahead. May your kingdom come and our prayer is offered in the name of the Messiah of Israel, Jesus Christ himself. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Anthony. Anthony, as I said, will be back soon. But first, this youth lesson from Tracy Z. Hi, I'm Tracy. And before we begin our lesson, I would like to remind you all that you need to always test everything you hear with the Bible. What does the Bible have to say about it? Please don't just believe me and don't believe what you hear in school or even in church. If a church or a school is teaching about other people more than they teach about Jesus and what he taught, we should be even more careful and be better Bible detectives. Today we're going to learn about some of Jesus' teachings in Luke 6 verses 27 through 36. Jesus was a human just like we are. He was tempted and he suffered just like we're tempted and we suffer even if they're in different ways. Jesus is still a human even today, but he is an immortal human. That means he can't die ever again. God raised Jesus from the dead and he is the first human to be given an immortal body and he will never die again. If we choose to trust him and follow his teachings, we too can have the same hope to be brought back to life when he returns and to be made immortal, never to die again or to be hurt again and we will have no more sadness or illness. So let's see what Jesus had to say in Luke. I say to you who are listening, are you listening? Love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. And then Jesus taught the golden rule. Treat others in the same way that you would want them to treat you. Love your enemies and do good and land expecting nothing back. <clears throat> then your reward will be great and you will be sons of the Most High God. And daughters, of course. And Jesus told us to be merciful to others, just as your Father is merciful to you. Thank you for joining me today to take a look at what Luke had to share with us about Jesus' teaching in regards to loving our enemies and the golden rule. One thing we need to remember, though, is even though we're told to love our enemies, that doesn't mean the bad things they do to us are okay or good or we should even allow them to happen. And God doesn't want them to happen, but he still wants us to not hate people. And just because we forgive people or we show love to our enemies, that doesn't mean we're saying what they did was acceptable or is even any good because we know it's bad when people harm other people. And Jesus doesn't want us to just be hurt by other people but he does want us to forgive them and just because we forgive them does not mean that we will have a relationship with them I've been hurt by people and I forgive them but just because I forgave them doesn't mean that I have to be their friend or have a relationship with them 
the forgiveness is between me and God. And he asked us to forgive people. Jesus taught us that. Forgive people because God forgives you when you do wrong. Even if your wrong wasn't as bad as what the person did to you. But maybe it's worse sometimes. So we just need to obey what Jesus said and to forgive people, to love our enemies, and to really do to other people what we want them to do to us. I hope you found Jesus' teaching encouraging, even if it's hard to do. But just know that when you choose to follow Jesus and what he taught, he will give you strength. He doesn't ask you to do anything that he wouldn't do himself. When he was hanging on the cross, in fact, and people had done terrible things to him, they nailed him to the cross and they were killing him. And he still said, Father, please forgive them because they don't know what they're doing. They don't understand the evil that they're doing. And it didn't make it right, but Jesus still chose to forgive because he knew that's what God wanted him to do as well. So remember, we wanna seek truth in the Bible to understand who Jesus really is and the things he taught and the hope that he promised us, which is resurrection if we die immortality if we choose to follow him and obey him and i hope to encourage you to seek that path and to live your life that way even if the people around you choose not to because you will be much happier when jesus returns if you are resurrected and given immortality so have a blessed day and remember test everything with the bible what does the bible say when you hear teachings about Jesus, about the Bible or anything. You need to check it out with the Bible. Know the rules, especially the golden rule. Amen. Thank you, Tracy, for that great reminder. As we say around here, don't believe anything we say. Check it out, the Acts 1711 rule, and then we hope you believe us. And Tracy is, as I said, from the Kingdom of God Ministry and Missions. And you can find all kinds of good stuff she does here on kogmissions.com. She has a very nice basic Bible lessons with uh, Anthony that she's done, put together, very short, good lessons. And remember the upcoming uh, missions conference and just click on there and It'll take you to the KOG Missions YouTube page. And that is October, starting October 27, as you see down there. And that's the direct link, link to the Missions Conference this fall. Again, starting October 27. And you can see all the dates and speakers there. So thanks once again to Tracy. So now, as we said, we continue with the rather somber, I must admit, book of Jeremiah, so-called weeping prophet. And we are in chapter five. And um, Anthony will lead us here into the reading, his reading of it and his commentary. If you have any questions, please type in all caps Keep your questions focused on the main sermon by Anthony. Thank you, Anthony. Okay, thank you, Carlos. <clears throat> We're in, as you said rightly, Jeremiah. In Hebrew, the word is Yermiahu, which means something like God will establish, God will raise him up. So he's a very positive figure, although he had to suffer a great deal in his role as a prophet because the story of the Bible is that people hate the truth generally. They are not just ready to accept the truth and embrace it. And so we begin in 5.1 of Jeremiah, where Yirmiyahu, the prophet, around about 600 BC, is saying this. He says, roam to and fro through the streets of Jerusalem and look now and take note God speaking to the prophet here, and seek in the open squares, in the town hall, the main streets, go and have a look in the city of Jerusalem. If you can find a man 
if there's one who does justice and who seeks truth. That is, as Carlos was saying, a rather dismal prospect. Go into the town and see if you can find a single person there who is really doing right rather than wrong, who is seeking the truth, loving the truth. I remind you, as I'm going to in the course of these discussions this morning, of various texts, I won't turn to all of them for the sake of time, but you remember that Paul said, you have to have a love of the truth in order to be saved. Did you hear that? A love of the truth. That means a hatred of the lies, by the way. If you love the truth, then you're going to hate the lies. But you have to have that, not in order to be smart, to be admired by everybody as some clever person. No, no. In order to be saved, and salvation means in order that you would gain immortality in the future kingdom and live forever and ever and ever and to be indestructible. So if that's your goal, and it should be the goal of all of us, then you're going to love the truth. So may the Lord God help us to love the truth that we learn in these chapters of Jeremiah this morning. So it reminds me so much then in verse one, if you can find a man, if there's even one who does right, justice is doing what is right rather than wrong doing right rather than wrong. And can you find anybody seeking the truth? The implied answer, of course, is it's going to be hard for you, Jeremiah, to find any. So Jesus said something very similar in Luke 18. I'll read that verse to you and you can go in your notes. I'm hoping that what you learn on a Sunday will be ready to go for your friends and inquirers in your circle of friends, wherever you're living. Wherever there's an interest in truth, you have your Bible marked with notes in the margin. And this verse in Jeremiah reminds me of Luke 18, verse 8. I tell you, Jesus said, that God will bring about justice for his own people. He, God is a God of justice. Nobody gets away with anything forever. Now, we can be forgiven for our errors. We understand that. But justice is going to be done. And Jesus then said in Luke 18, 8, when the Son of Man comes, Son of Man is J Jesus' favorite self-title. He is the human being, not your average human being, because he didn't have a physical father and he was resurrected from the dead. So he's not just your average human being, far from it. Not just a mere man, as some people say scoffingly. He's a unique human being, the Son of Man. So when he comes, Jesus said, the supreme teacher, by the way, Jesus was a master rabbi and teacher, instructor. And Jesus asked this question, will I, the son of man, find anybody with the truth? Will he find the faith? He seems to question that. Now, I don't like even reading those verses because they're in some sense, in quotes, depressing because Jesus is saying, in regard to what I see going on around me, there is such a fierce opposition to what I'm teaching, and it was. You know what they did with the Messiah? They executed him. They silenced him. They tried to shut him up. They tried to stifle what he was saying, and yet he was God's unique Son of Man, Messiah, and he's the king of the coming kingdom. I must tell you this morning, my head is just full of the events of the last few days. I relived a lot of my own past in England by watching the extraordinary ceremony by which King Charles III became king. Now, I'm not obsessed with politics. I don't actually vote in America because I'm a green card person, but I'm fascinated by the history that I was watching there. King Charles III. I hope that this makes you think of King Jesus. I hope you realize that to be the Messiah is not just a vague surname as though Jesus Christ was the child of Mary and Joseph Christ. That's just absurd. No, Christ means the king, the ultimate king who is going to sort out the world. He's going to reorganize the world. He's going to reset the world. That is the gospel that I'm telling you there. So let's start by reminding ourselves the gospel is not 
just that Jesus died for you and rose. That's very important. But there's only half the gospel. On the television just recently, the grandson of Billy Graham was interviewed. And his father had been friendly with the late queen who died, as you know, this last week. Reminded me that Billy Graham did not define the gospel correctly. You can check that out. Billy Graham said that Jesus came to do three days work. To die, to be buried, and to be raised. That's just false. That is absolutely false. I'm hoping that you'll tell your friends that Jesus came to preach the gospel of the kingdom firstly. And in addition to that, of course, he talked about his death for our sins. That's clear. But you can create an interest in your friends if they are showing any interest at all that King Jesus is going to rule the world. So we find in verse 2 then of chapter 5 of Jeremiah, can you find a man? Is there anybody who's seeking the truth? There aren't many. So Jesus seemed doubtful as to whether the faith, the truth, would even survive. I don't like that. It gives me no pleasure to read these verses, but I've got to face the reality. But that's the way it's likely to be. Verse 2. Although they say, as the Lord lives, that's capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. That stands, as you know, about 7,000 times for the word Yahweh. It may be Yehovah. It doesn't matter how you pronounce it. The New Testament Greek scriptures make no issue about that at all. They just call him the Lord. But in the Hebrew of the Old Testament, you have capital L-O-R-D, meaning Yahweh or Yehovah. As the Lord lives. Look at the religious flavor of what these people are saying. They keep saying, as the Lord lives. Sounds very pious, very religious, but they're swearing falsely. It's no good at all having a lot of biblical knowledge if your life is not in tune with your beliefs. Verse 3 says this, Lord, addressing Jeremiah here, addressing Yahweh, the one God of Israel, do your eyes not look for honesty? You bet they do. The answer is implied there. God is looking at his creation. Imagine how many sons and daughters God has from Adam and Eve. Can you imagine that? It's absolutely mind-boggling, the creation and the phenomenon of human populations. And God is looking to see who will serve him. And he's having a hard time finding anybody to do it. And then Jeremiah remarks on this, you God, talking to God here, you've struck them. You punished them. You tried to get their attention, but they wouldn't weaken. You've even consumed them. You've brought tragedy and difficulty into their lives, maybe, but they refused to accept discipline. That's an image, of course, from a father punishing a son or daughter. They refused to repent, and they made their faces harder than rock. I love the imagery of the Bible. It's a very clever way to write, by the way. This inspired writing is amazing. There are images, there are pictures from every department of life. I'm not an expert in rocks, but I can understand that you can make your face harder than a rock. It so happens we live in Georgia in, on a property that has a marvelous section of rock. And when I walk on that, I think that's interesting. That's a biblical image. Let my heart not be like a rock, you say to yourself, because it's the same as refusing to repent. So I'm hoping you're going to teach your friends this week and engage them in conversation. What in the world is repentance? What in the world is repent? They refuse to repent. That was a very bad idea. They refuse to repent. Then I said, they are only the poor. They're foolish. They do not know the way of the Lord. This is a very negative evaluation of the people of Jeremiah's time. What if the people of our own time are like this too? They don't know the way of the Lord. They don't understand that God is a judge. This is an image then from a law court. And the Bible, in a sense, really is a lawsuit against us. God is the judge. We're the ones being prosecuted by what God has to say. So in verse 5, you get this idea developed. I, God, will go to the great. That's to say the, the so-called leaders of the people, the great, the famous, the uh, 
people in positions of superiority, in a sense, every society has them, I'll speak to them. They are going to, surely they'll know the way of the Lord God is helpful. Surely they understand how God thinks the judgment of their God. But alas, what does he find? Together, they too have broken the yoke. That, of course, is an image from farming. When you uh, plow, you use oxen who are yoked together to do the work. And if they break the yoke, it means they've given up working. So even the great have broken the yoke and they've thrown off the restraints. They're undisciplined. They're doing everything wrong. And therefore, one of our teachers used to say, when you have the word therefore, you always want to see what it is there for. So as a result of what Jeremiah found, the refusal of most human beings to take any notice of what God is saying, this is what's going to happen. A lion from the forest will kill them. A wolf of the deserts will destroy them. A leopard is watching at their cities. Those are animals symbolizing evil, attacking, war-making war human beings. Watch out, there's going to be an attack. Today happens to be a very solemn reminder of what happened in September, what, 21 years ago. My head is just full of this, having watched the Queen and the accession of King Charles III yesterday. Now the very next day, this horrifying reminder. And the fact that we have film of all this is so vivid. So a lion attacked America on 9-11 a savage animal. That's the most vivid way of expressing then a furious and a destructive enemy. Why? Because their wrongdoings are many. Their apostasies, what's that word mean? Apostasies, to stand away from, to reject, to give up on the faith. To be apostate means you've given up true belief. So we examine ourselves and we say, where am I in all of this? Am I apostate or am I faithfully following the truth? Am I doing what I should to promote the gospel about the kingdom, which is what Jesus did all of his career, all of his ministry? Then God asks the question then, why should I forgive you? Your sons have forsaken me. I don't like this material, but it's very, very real. And we apply it to ourselves. Your sons and your daughters have apostatized from me. They've stood away from me. They're not taking a blind piece of notice of what I'm doing. They don't care about the Bible. And this is true of my Church of England days. We didn't do the Bible. We thought that was a very strange American habit to take a Bible to church. I mean, who does that? Americans might do that. We mocked in our very proud way. But now I've learned differently and sworn by those who are not gods. Interesting. The problem is idolatry. In the book of Jeremiah, idolatry, of course, as everywhere in the Bible, means that you're worshiping somebody who isn't God. So that gives me then an opportunity to say to you, the Trinitarian idea of God is a very pagan idea. Are you troubled by your friends who go to a Trinitarian church and they worship a triune God who is really three, but really one, not one, not three, but somehow mysteriously one and yet three? Are you troubled by that? You wake up in the morning and say, what am I going to do about this? Or do you say, well, it's all good stuff. They're all very sincere and they're fine. I don't get that impression from reading Jeremiah. Idolatry is a very serious mistake. And this is what the people of Israel this time and of Judah. We're talking about two kingdoms here. The northern kingdom, the ten tribes, you know, had gone into captivity in 722 BC. And now the southern kingdom, which is Judah and Benjamin probably and some of the Levites, they are threatened with national deportation. Why? Because they're not paying attention to what God is saying. So verse 9 says, shall I not, God asks the question, shall I not indeed punish them for these things? They're lustful. Sex has gotten out of hand. We 
blithely in America today, we talk about the Judeo-Christian tradition. I wish people would look at their Bibles and see, is it really? I thought homosexuality, let me be very tendentious here, homosexuality is condemned fiercely in the New Testament. But you better not say that publicly in America because that's one of the great things that leaders stand for. What are you doing to change that? Are you appalled by the loss of truth that you see around you? We should be. Okay, here then more of the same. Go up through her vine rows and destroy. This is a threat of destruction then. And this happened in 586 BC to the southern kingdom of Judah, the house of Judah, who have dealt treacherously with God, capital M-E, with God, declares Yahweh. They've lied about the Lord. Has it occurred to you that your friends might be lied to in church? Oh no, my pastor's been to school. He knows what he's talking about. Wait a minute. They have lied in the time of Jeremiah. The leaders have lied about the Lord and said, not he. He, of course, stands for God then. I remind you that the singular personal pronoun describes God hundreds and hundreds of times. 1,300 times in the New Testament, God is the Father. This is called unitary monotheism, one Godism. And I think most of our audience this morning are believing in that. But what are you doing to help your neighbors see through the nonsense of three is really one and one is really three? God is upset by these things. I want to give you a verse, if I may, throw this in, in Ecclesiastes 8.11, which really speaks loud to me. You'll find in the book of Ecclesiastes, I'll refer, I'll refer to it, chapter 8, verse 11. It says there very wisely in the book of Ecclesiastes 8, verse 11, that because judgment and sentence are not pronounced on evil right now, Therefore, everybody feels free to get on with the evil. How very true that is. If you say, well, I believe in a triune God, a paganized God, the sky doesn't fall on your head. There's no evidence that God is judging at the moment. And that's why so wisely in Ecclesiastes 8 verse 11, you'll find that Solomon, who wrote the book of Ecclesiastes, fully realized because sentence is not pronounced on you now, you get away with murder. But that's not going to be ultimately the case. So the Shema, the hero Israel, is fundamentally important. When I was in the Church of England, I didn't know this because I was ignorant, but I was getting a churchified version of the Bible. I was getting a philosophized version of the Bible. Let me just take a second to explain that to you. In the Bible, God is one person. You count how many God is. He's one, not more. However, in Greek philosophy, led by Plato originally, who was homosexual and believed in that and actually fostered the whole idea, he said, no, no, God is to be defined by his nature and not by his number. Oh, I see. Well, guess what? The church fathers, so-called, have misled you all. They've said, look, we like the definition of Plato, and Plato thinks of godishness. Can you imagine everything in the universe has a quality about it? He doesn't count how many God is. He says, what sort of character has God got? And so he defined God in terms of nature, not number. Explain this to your friends. The Bible defines God in terms of number, number one. We did this extensively in Africa with the Malawian people. They love this truth. However, Plato said, no, no, you don't define God in terms of number. You define him in terms of nature. So then they say, well, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit all have the same common nature. They called it essence or the Greek word usia. What they did then was to give you a retranslation of the idea of God into foreign terms. Well, guess what happens when you do that? You're speaking another language. So you'd better be sure. Do you think that God is going to approve, or Jesus is going to approve you? If you go around saying God is really three and really one, it's a mystery, I can't explain it. 
are you going to say with one of the authors of the Trinity books these days, you're supposed to say, he are three, and you're supposed to say, they is one. Well, I'm here to suggest to you that God may not be pleased with that. It doesn't mean he's going to execute you, strike you down if you do it, but watch out. The definition of God is extremely important. Otherwise, Jesus would not have said, what is the greatest and first supremely important commandment of all? Speaking to a friendly Jew. So I've written a couple of books on this. You're perhaps aware of them. But Jesus was not a Trinitarian. Look at this, 11. House of Israel, that's the 10 tribes who had gone into captivity in 722, and the southern kingdom of Judah have dealt treacherously with God. Isn't that an awful thing? So you say to yourself, how well are we doing? They've lied about the Lord. They've said, not he. They've said they. They turned God into a threesome. And then they said, well, nothing can happen to us. That's fine. We're doing well. Misfortune will not come upon us. We won't see any sword or family. We won't be punished for this. And this, then this shatteringly interesting verse in 13, where you have the following words in 13, the prophets, that's the preachers of the time, what are they like? They're as wind. Wow. That's in verse 13. The prophets are as wind, and the word is not in the preachers. Thus, it will be done to them. They're going to be in deep, deep trouble because those who teach the Bible are held more responsible than those who don't. The word is not in them. Now, most of you think the word in the Bible means the Bible. That's not, not, not right. So let's learn something very important this morning. The word word in the Bible mostly means the gospel of the kingdom. Perhaps not invariably, but most often. The word for the Bible in the Bible is the scriptures. And Jesus loved the scriptures. He kept saying the scriptures say God has spoken his words in scripture. So the phrase word is much too vague if you think of it just as the Bible. It means expressly the word of the gospel of the kingdom, Matthew 13, 19, Matthew 13, 19. I won't talk, I won't turn to it. But the whole point of Christianity is that you announce as Jesus did the gospel of the kingdom. So they're going to be punished. These preachers who don't get this right are going to have to pay for this. And here it is, judgment proclaimed. Therefore, therefore, this is what the Lord, Jehovah, Yahweh, doesn't matter how you pronounce it, the God of armies, he's the God of all the armies of heaven, all the angels, the multitudes and millions and millions of angels who serve him. This is what God says. Because you've spoken this word, this word wrongly, in, in fact, he's accusing, he's indicting, he's taking them to court, God is. Look, here's what I'm going to do. Behold, look at this. I am making my words like fire in your mouth. That's spoken to the true prophets then. The words of scripture are like fire in the mouth of the true teacher. And the people then are like wood. They're going to be consumed by these words. If they don't respond to the words, if they don't listen to the words of Jesus, not just his works on the cross, that's, that's very important, but you're supposed to listen to the words of Jesus, then watch out. Those words are going to be fiery and you're going to be like wood, you're going to be burned up. And here's the threat. This is a threatening chapter, as is much of the book of Jeremiah, verse 15. Look, I'm going to bring a nation against you, far away from you, house of Israel, my people Israel, declares the Lord. This is most interesting to me. It's an enduring nation. It's a very ancient nation. It's a nation speaking other than Hebrew or English a language you don't know, and you can't even understand what they say, but I'm going to give them power over you. Why is God doing this? Because he wants to wake his people up. Their quiver, that's an image from bow and arrow, of course, is like an open grave. All of them are warriors, fighters. 
And here's what they do. Here's a typical picture then of destruction and trouble and invasion. Verse 17, they will devour your harvest. That's a very bad thing. Harvest, we know what that is. And your food. They're going to eat up, gobble up your sons and daughters. They're going to gobble up, devour your flocks and your herds. That's a typical biblical picture of a bad time coming, isn't it? Absolutely, very vivid. They will devour your vines. The vine, you know, is also a symbol of the true people of God. It's a good thing. Jesus talked about being a vineyard and the branches and so on of a vineyard. And the fig tree is very special in scripture too. They're going to be eaten up. Look at that word, devour, 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 demolish. This is a terrible threat. And it happened in 586 BC. Even in those days, declares the Lord. Here's the merciful part of this threat. I will not make a complete destruction of you. There's always a remnant who are going to survive. I want to have uh, suggest that you have Isaiah chapter 24, verse 6. I'll refer to it. Isaiah 24, verse 6, describes the devastating nature of the future judgment of God at the second coming. And in 24, 6 of Isaiah, Isaiah 24, verse 6 says, few people are left. That's a very scary picture of the degree of destruction, annihilation, punishment that God is proposing to mete out on a world that doesn't listen to him. So declare this, the prophet is told in the house of Jacob or Israel, proclaim it in Judah, both countries, both the Northern Kingdom who went into captivity in 722 and now the one in the South, Judah or Jews as we call them, were threatened with destruction, which actually also happened in about 586 BC, but that's not the end of the story. Proclaim this in the southern kingdom, Judah. Listen to this. It's, God is not exactly polite, you might say. You foolish, you stupid people. You senseless people who have eyes, but they're blind, and you have ears, but do not hear. You know that Jesus loved these verses? Surely that reminds you then of the parable of the sower. If you want one parable which is so essential, it's the parable of the sower. And perhaps you don't know what the seed was that Jesus was sowing. It's called the gospel of the kingdom, Matthew 13, 19. All of this then should come right out of your mouth when you're speaking to your friends to enable them to read the Bible with intelligence. Now this dotty people, these senseless people, these useless people are threatened then with being blind spiritually. 22, God piles on the rhetoric here. Do you not fear me? Declares Yahweh. Do you not tremble at my presence? You know, we're supposed to fear God. It shouldn't mean that we're in constant terror of him, but we should have a very healthy strong sense of reverence for God. Don't you reverence my presence? You should. And here, then God says, here's a good reason why you might want to take me seriously. Look what I've done. I've placed the sand as a boundary for the sea. Isn't that amazing? It's the argument from creation being brought to bear here. I love that. My wife is a master gardener, and so I admire uh, the flowers. I've learned more about flowers and trees because of what she does out there. It's simply astonishing that God's handiwork, the bird song, God's evidence, the butterflies, the swallowtails in Georgia. What on earth is going on around me all the time? Well, the answer is God's hand in creation is demonstrably there. So God says, look, look what I've done. Think about how you should revere me. Eternal limit and the sand blocks the sea. Wow. The sea cannot cross the boundary that I imp imposed on it. Even though the waves toss, they cannot prevail. The waves may roar, but the water 
will not go across the sand. Isn't that amazing? But I love the language here. It's very powerful. You have to stop and read this very slowly and consider what's being said. This people, this people, Judah, in this case, historically, has a stubborn and rebellious heart. They have turned aside. They've apostatized. They've forsaken God. They've departed. They've gone off to do their own thing. They do not say in their mind, in their heart, the heart is this seat of the intellect and the thinking in the Bible. They don't say, come on, let's fear the Lord our God. After all, he gives us rain in due season. He gives us the autumn rain, what we call autumn in England, I think the fall in America. We get fall rain and spring rain. You see, you look at what God is doing. God is everywhere in evidence around us. And God who keeps for us the appointed weeks of the harvest. All of that wonderful, wonderful uh, plan that you see operating day after day. But you have to stop in your day, in your busy day, and consider and think about the marvel of the creation all around you. 25, he adds another point. Your wrongdoings, the things you've done wrong, the appallingly bad definition of God that you're doing in your churches, your sanctifying of marriages that are not marriages, the extreme divorce rate, which is hideous for God, you've turned away from these good things and your sins, your failures, as Tracy was talking about, your failures to love your neighbor as yourself, your failure to follow the teachings and the words, the instructions of Jesus, who spoke for God uniquely as a rabbi, your sins have kept good things away from you. Then he goes on. There are wicked people who are found among my people. That should not be so. They watch like fowlers, that's to say, ready to catch. A fowler, I gather, then would be lying in wait, ready to trap. They trap the people, these false prophets do. They catch people in the wrong sense. You know, Jesus talked about the true disciples fishing for men. That's right. You fish for people to bring them the gospel of the kingdom to get them saved. But here, these evil prophets and teachers are catching people wrongly, like a cage full of birds. Their houses, we might say their churches even, it, they haven't been destroyed by their lies. Some of them became great and rich. Others suffered at the hands of the system terribly, taking a medicine they thought would prevent them from getting sick and it put them into a state of paralysis. That is a shocking thing. They are fat, some of them, they're sleek. But they really do this deeds of wickedness thing. Well, they excel. They're very good at doing evil. So I want you then to view the world around you and say, how much of this might apply to us in the so-called civilized West? How much are you being lied to and you're not paying attention? This is a serious question. Okay, what have we got? The prophets, look at this one. I note that Sarah took these particular verses and highlighted them. The prophets are doing what? The prophets are speaking lies. Uh, where is that one about the prophets? Yes, they watch like fowlers, they set traps. The prophets, many of them are fat and sleek. It's the, it's the verse I'm looking for where the prophets are speaking terrible things. It's verse 31. That's it. Yes, thank you. They've lied about the Lord. Can you imagine that? Prophets and preachers are lying. It doesn't mean they're intending to lie, but because they're carelessly not doing the Bible as they should, they've actually got congregations in front of them Sunday by Sunday by Sunday, and they're being lied to, those people. An appalling and horrible thing, God says. God didn't say, well, that's okay. They're all good people. No, no, no. An appalling 
and horrible thing has happened in the land of Israel. Could this apply to our own time? You need to think about that. The prophets are prophesying falsely. Didn't Jesus say, beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing? They're very clever. They look good. They sound good. They sound wonderful. They're just like meek sheep. And yet they're lying to you. And the priests, part of the religious system, are lying to you too. Okay, Carlos, you want to say something? Yep, that was the chapter, I think. Uh, yep. We reached the end there of chapter yes. five. Yes. Just a brief comment from me. Um, yes, verse please. On, uh, what do you got? Where was it? Where it says, verse three. Yeah. They they have made their faces harder than rock. Yes. Uh, it reminded me of the suffering servant. Mm -hmm. What is said about him, Isaiah 50. Yeah. But the Lord God helps me, therefore I have not been disgraced. Yes. Therefore I have set my face like a flint yep. or a rock. Yep. And I know that I shall not be put to shame. So that's yep. an interesting contrast. It is. Where you can set your visage, your face, mm -hmm. yourself mm -hmm. as a rock uh, firm in the Lord. Or you can be firm not in the Lord. <laughs> yes. In this case, firm in all these awful uh, yes. immoral behavior. Yes bad doctrine, adultery, yes, and, and so on. So I thought that was quite a It story. is an interesting parallel indeed, yes. Okay, so that judgment then is being, this is a threat and a warning, but the gospel I want to say to the audience is a threat. When Jesus said the kingdom of God is at hand, that's the gospel of the kingdom, that's a threat. It means watch out, judgment day is coming, are you going to repent or are you going to take no notice? So the gospel is a threat. What we've done is to soften the story and to take half of it and say, well, God has forgiven you because Christ died for you. Wonderful. That's perfectly true. But forgiven for what purpose? What is the threat there? If you don't repent, you're going to be destroyed. If you don't obey Jesus and God, then you're going to be destroyed. So the whole Bible is about, are you going to listen to what God said through his prophets and ultimately through the ultimate prophet Jesus, or are you going to not? So I'm asking people then to write in their notes, Hebrews 5 verse 9, I'll refer to it. It says that salvation, salvation means how to live forever and ever and ever, to how to be indestructible. Salvation is given to those, you know the next words, who obey Jesus. My goodness. It doesn't say salvation is going to be given to those who believe that Jesus died for your sins. That's part of it. But the great insight from my angle of the Abrahamic people was to see that the gospel has suffered at the hands of false preachers. And what are we going to do about it? We better stand for God. We better plead with people to believe the words of Jesus, not just the works of Jesus. We have an article in the current uh, Focus on the Kingdom from Robin Todd, where he speaks about the faith of Jesus. And by that is meant the same faith that Jesus had. You're supposed to have the same faith in God, the same truth that Jesus believed, that's what you're supposed to have. You're supposed to have the same words that Jesus had. So the faith of Jesus doesn't just mean faith in Jesus. Well, I believe he died for me. That's very important but it's only half of the truth and half truths are very, very dangerous. Okay, what else, Carlos? Anything else by way of comment or what? Uh, yes, uh, question. Uh, mm. Does God still involve himself today in any way with an immediate penalty to people like in those days or yeah. is it only fulfilled by Jesus at Judgment Day? Yes, I don't know the answer to that in individual cases. My sense is the Ecclesiastes 8, 11 verse that I gave earlier, because sentence is not executed straight away, Ecclesiastes 8, 11, people go on doing well, badly. They go on doing badly. 
because sentence is not executed. I don't know the exact answer to that question in every case, but I wouldn't risk doing evil saying to yourself, well, God doesn't intervene to punish now. He certainly can do that. On the whole, I think he is not executing judgment. Otherwise, that text in Ecclesiastes 8, 11 would not be true. So it's a good question, very good question. But God is certainly ultimately going to punish. And that's the verse in Hebrews 10, 30, which says, I'm, I'm the Lord, I repay. I am the one who repays. I am the Lord who avenges. Oh, there it is. Vengeance is mine, God said in Hebrews 10, 30. I will repay. I, using Jesus as his agent, will repay all evil. You don't get away with anything in the long term. There is the story in the early church uh, recorded by Luke yep. in the Acts of the couple who are struck dead when they are yes. uh, lying yes. to the Holy Spirit. Right. So that did happen in the early church. Uh, we did. doubt it happens today. Yeah. Uh, just a quick comment before going to the next chapter, yes. Anthony. Mm -hmm. In yes. verse 18, I think you mentioned this about yep. few people left. Yes. Verse 18, I will not make a complete destruction of you. Mm -hmm. I think you referenced Isaiah 24. That's right. Uh, therefore, a curse devours the earth, its inhabitants suffer for their guilt. Yep. Therefore, the inhabitants of the earth are scorched or burnt. Yes. And few are left. Yes. Now, we are often asked what we will be doing or what will be the kingdom of God like. Yeah. Well, these few people left, uh, we believe, will make up the nations of the yes. kingdom. Yes. Yes. And we will govern or reign over those nations, yes. if you like to expand a bit on, on yeah, that. Yeah, that's, that's true. There is a denomination, I think the Seventh-day Adventists, who didn't like that verse. Let me give you an example of the treacherous way in which some denominations have dealt with the Bible. As Carlos just had that verse up there, verse 6, the curse has consumed the earth, rather along the lines of the words of Jeremiah. And they bear the guilt. The earth's dwellers have been burned. And then when Ellen G. White got to these words and only a few people survived, she left them out. She did, she did what we would call dot, dot, dot theology. Didn't like that because in her scheme, and she had the arrogance to say that she knew better than the Bible. In her scheme, Satan alone would be available and alive on the earth during the millennium. Only Satan would be there. There'd be no Christians there on the earth for the millennium. They'd all be in heaven going over the book. That is absolutely false. And I would recommend that you distance yourself from that sort of nonsense. Classical premillennialism is the right view of Revelation 20. It speaks there of people who've been beheaded. They're singled out for special mention, the ones who are martyred. They come to life having been beheaded. That's a real resurrection. You don't get beheaded at conversion. That's just sheer nonsense. But those who had been killed for the faith came back to life in resurrection and began to reign as kings with the Messiah for a thousand years. That should be clear to you. If it's not clear to you, please study that until that becomes entirely clear to you. So that's a, a, right. a good point there. Yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And uh, we'll go to chapter six. Anthony, I'll help uh, with the reading here. See if we can get through this chapter as well about the same length. The coming destruction of Jerusalem. This is the NASB, by the way. Flee to safety, you sons of Benjamin, from the midst of Jerusalem. Blow a trumpet in Tekoa and raise a warning signal over Beth. Hasherem, for evil looks down from the north along with a great destruction. The beautiful and de delicate one, the daughter of Zion, I will destroy. Shepherds and their flocks will come to her. They will pitch their tents around her. They will pasture each in his place, prepare for war against her. Arise, let's attack at noon. Woe to us, for the day declines, for the shadows of the evening, evening lengthens. Arise and let's attack by night and destroy her 
palaces, for this is what the Lord of armies says, cut down her trees and pile up an assault ramp against Jerusalem. This is the city to be punished, in whose midst there's only oppression as, as a well keeps its waters fresh. So she keeps fresh her wickedness, violence and destruction are hurt in her sickness and wounds are constantly before me be warned jerusalem or i shall be alienated from you and make you a desolation and uninhabited land wow okay so you may say well what is this in terms of prophecy for us today let's now turn our minds to the future you remember in matthew 24 mark 13 and luke 21 jesus was asked what is the sign of your future coming in the end of the age? A great deal of confusion has come over that passage. The end of the age, I must tell you, was not 70 AD. You see, God works in patterns. That's why the Bible is such an economically clever book. It keeps repeating the same idea, and there are multiple fulfillments of the same prophecy. So if you're thinking that it was only in 586 BC that Judah, was to be attacked, that would be wrong. Jesus himself replied to the question, when will there be a destruction of the temple and what will be the sign of your coming and end of the age? The end of the age is future. <clears throat> the end of the age is not 70 AD. If it was 70 AD, Jesus would have taken his position on the throne of David and he didn't. You can go to Israel today and ask the rabbis, is this the Messiah's kingdom in Israel? Nah, it is not. Because the son of David, the Messiah, is not sitting on his throne in Jerusalem. That is the grand vision of the entire Bible, by the way. If you want a vista view of the whole Bible story, it ends on a very happy note when King David's son, the Messiah, great, great grandson, I mean, multiple greats, but the descendant of David, you remember Luke 1 32 says that the Lord God will give Jesus the throne of his father, David, and he will reign as a king forever. That's the gospel. That is the gospel. It's a happy ending. And we're going to find it in the book of Jeremiah, particularly in chapter three, 23 and 33, easy to remember, 3, 23 and 33, a wonderful vision of that grand future when the nations beat their swords into plowshares and Jesus, assisted by the saints, will be ruling the world. I want, Carlos, if you don't mind, I want to read this quote and repeat it week by week by Martin Lloyd-Jones, a famous preacher talking about 1 Corinthians 6, verse 2, and this is the vista vision, the end time, happy time coming. And Martin Lloyd-Jones said it so beautifully. He said this, Martin Lloyd-Jones commenting on 1 first, first, uh, 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 Corinthians 6, verse 2. He said this, we will dwell in glorified bodies. This is you now as a Christian, on the glorified earth. I've heard nothing but how the queen now has passed off. She's passed away, which is nonsense. She hasn't passed away anywhere. She's dead. They don't know that. So what are you doing to help these people understand? Here's what Martin Lord Jones reported on 1 Corinthians 6 2. We're going to dwell in glorified bodies on the glorified earth. This is one of the great Christian doctrines that has been entirely, almost entirely, forgotten and ignored. What? This is the gospel. It's been forgotten. Unfortunately, said Martin Lloyd-Jones, the Christian church, I'm speaking generally, does not believe this. And the Christian church doesn't believe the gospel. What are you doing to redress this bad situation? The Christian church, he said, doesn't believe this and therefore doesn't teach it. It has lost its hope. And this explains why the church spends most of its time trying to make and improve this world by preaching politics. But something remarkable, Martin Norgen said, is going to be true of us Christians, according to the apostle in 1 Corinthians 6, verses 1 to 3. Here's what Paul said. Dare any of you 
having a matter against someone else, dare any of you go to law before the unjust and not before the saints? Don't you know that the saints will rule the world? I didn't learn that in church. Have you thought about that? Don't you know, said Paul, this elementary truth that the saints will rule the world? This is Christianity, Martin Lord Jones said. This is Christianity. This is the truth by which the New Testament church lived. It was because of this truth that they were not afraid of their persecutors. This was the secret of their endurance, their patience, and their triumphing over everything that was set against them. That is a marvelous quotation. I quoted it actually in my Amazing Aims and Claims book on page 34, but I want to repeat that week after week. I hope that you fully understood that marvelous saying. Okay. Uh, just a question yes. uh, for me. Oh, yeah. From me and, and yeah. for others. The opening of uh, chapter six here yes. reminds me a lot of, let's see, uh, you know, the, uh, the fact that Zion, Jerusalem is being. Uh, surrounded by yes. her enemies yes as you said you you went to the sermon on the mount the sorry the uh, prophecy uh, on the mount of olives yeah <clears throat> for yeah. example matthew 24 you can say verse one get out of jerusalem yes jesus talks about fleeing you know during the uh mm -hmm. before his the parousia but there is another passage which has intrigued many historians, uh -huh. as you know, in Luke 19, when yeah. Jesus uh, does his uh, triumphal entry. Yes. Uh, now, this is not the the pro the Olivet prophecy no. discourse. This no. is before it. Yes. And then you know, people. Some people welcome him. Blessed is the King. Yes. He comes in the name of the Lord. And then he says this uh, rather enigmatic thing. Yes. Uh, when he approached Jerusalem, he saw the city and wept, yes. saying, if you had known on this day, even yes. you, the conditions for peace, but now they have been hidden from your eyes. Yes. For the days will come upon you when your enemies will put up a barricade against you. Yes. Surround you, hem you in on every side. They will level you to the ground, throw you... Yeah your children down within you and so on it sounds awfully a lot like 70 a.d uh what do you make of this passage well it isn't a.d 70 i'll tell you why because in matthew 24 he describes a time of great trouble the great tribulation then he says yeah, immediately is, after in sorry this anthony yeah uh again this is not the prophecy of luke no. 21 uh later in Luke, a couple yeah. of chapters later he'll He'll do the uh, prophecy, Luke. Yes. Uh, th this seems detached from that, or sorry, do you see it as the same thing? I, I think it's the same thing. I think it's a, a double prophecy there, same event. Certainly, 70 AD was a disaster, but it didn't bring in the kingdom. So this, I would say, is also a prophecy of the future. It was partially fulfilled in AD 70, but we do remember in Jeremiah, there's coming somebody from the north. The north, the north is always the source of the enemy. And in what we've written on this subject, you'll find that Assyria is the northern kingdom. And now you do have a situation in the Middle East where Iran, Iraq, Syria are dead set against Israel. So I would say that though AD 70 is certainly a type, it's a pattern, it's not the actual event and i would expect then this to be fulfilled as you watch without setting dates the things of the future in the middle east so yeah it's a great it's a great point thank and, you uh, anthony yeah. uh okay i'll read the next uh passage here and we're back in jeremiah 6 uh verse 9 this is what the lord of armies says they will thoroughly glean the remnant of israel like the vine pass your hand over the branches again like a grape gather to whom shall i speak and give warning that they may hear behold their ears are closed they cannot listen behold the word of the lord has become for them a rebuke they take no delight in it but i am full of the wrath of the lord i'm wary of holding it in pour it out on the children in the street and on the gathering of young men together for both husband and wife shall be taken the old and the very old their houses shall be turned over to others, their fields 
and their wives together, for I will stretch out my hand against the inhabitants of the land, declares the Lord. For from the least of them to the greatest, everyone is greedy for gain. And from the prophet to the priest, everyone deals falsely. They have healed the brokenness of my people superficially, saying, peace, peace, but there is no peace. Were they ashamed because of the abomination they had done? They were not ashamed at all, nor did they know even how to be ashamed. Therefore, they will fall among those who fall. At the time that I punish them, they will collapse, collapse says the Lord. Yeah. Well, that's very much the same, isn't it, of what we've been doing? Uh, this is an interesting geographical point there in verse 1 of our chapter. You've got Tekoa, blow a trumpet in Tekoa. We just read it, and that is the sign of war. Trumpet in the Bible means watch out, war is coming. Tekoa is about three miles south of Bethlehem. The southern kingdom in 586 was taken into captivity at the hands of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. That is a type, a model of a much greater abomination of desolation which will punish Israel. There are nations, as we all know, in the Middle East who say we'd like to wipe Israel off the face of the earth. Now, I remind us that Israel in the Bible refers both to the international church. You and I are the Israel of God in Galatians 6.16. But the nation of Israel, the ethnic Jewish people, as we would call them today, the ethnic Israel are still there in the Middle East. The Messiah is not there. The kingdom is not there. And they are threatened then with the great tribulation. The church does not need to go through that great tribulation. They can escape by fleeing to the mountains, not by taking to heaven in a preacher of rapture. The preacher of rapture is a falsehood, doesn't exist. But there is coming a time of great trouble. Jesus said that in Matthew 24, I think probably also in Luke 19. But you could say that that one refers to AD 70 specifically. But it's the same idea as the final great tribulation, Matthew 24, 29 says immediately after that great tribulation, there'll be cosmic signs and wonders. Then they will see the son of man coming in power and great glory. That's the second coming of Jesus to bring peace, the ultimate dawn, the time coming, the happy time coming when Jesus returns. So, I'm glad we got on onto this because it gives more relevance to these Jeremiah prophecies than otherwise if we didn't mention them. And there it is, the enemy from the north in 21. You see that? The enemy from the north. That's the subtitle in the New American Standard Version. The enemy from the north, the north. Not the west, not an enemy from Europe. Not an enemy from the south, which would be Egypt. But from the north, from Babylon, the Assyrian, or Syrian, one of those nations, probably a confederation of 10, according to Psalm 83. You can look that one up sometime. 10 nations there ranged against the people of Israel in the future. There it is in 22. Behold, a people is coming from the Northland. We found that in the first chapter of Jeremiah. There was a picture of a boiling pot facing the north. So this is um, a standard prophecy. Sorry, yeah. Anthony, we okay, haven't good. gotten to that. I stopped uh, okay. at 15. Anything else you'd like to say Yeah. Uh, from verses 1 to 15? Or? Let's see. Let me just look. Uh, 1 Does through 15. It's much the same, isn't it? Yeah. It's about the word of the Lord in verse 10 becoming a reproach to them. They don't delight in it. That reminds us of Psalm 1. You're supposed to have a passion for the word of God. You wake up in the morning meditating on the Bible. You fall asleep at night meditating on the words of the scripture. That's the ideal there. But people often have no delight in it. Then one needs to change that. In verse 10, their ears are closed. They cannot listen. That's the parable of the sower. If you're deaf to the words of Jesus, you're deaf to Christianity. Threat then in verse 12, of houses being turned over to the enemies and so on. I'll stretch out my hand in verse 12 against the inhabitants. Even the least of them is greedy for gain. That's a terrible indictment, isn't it? Money is their objective. 
and the false prophets are dealing falsely. Okay, do you want to read the rest of the chapter for us or what? Uh, you, you can, Anthony, from okay. uh, verse 16, if you'd yes. like. This is what the Lord says. Thank you. Stand by the ways and see and ask for the ancient path. Ah, I get it. Jude says, seek the original faith. Return to the faith once and for all delivered to the saints. That's in Jude chapter 6. This is what the prophet says here. Go back to the original biblical truth. Give up your churchified, philosophied Bible version where you've got a God who is three rather than one and all sorts of things like going to heaven when you die, which is absolutely unbiblical, passing away when you die rather than falling asleep in death. Go back to the ancient truths where the good way is and walk in it. Conduct your life. That's to say, again, Psalm 1 is there. Blessed is the man who doesn't walk or stand or sit. Three postures there, either standing or walking or sitting in error. You should be doing these things in the truth. Then you will find a resting place for yourselves with soul is self there. But they said, nah, we won't do it. So I then set prophets over the watchmen. Watch out, war is coming. They said, we're not going to listen. Therefore, hear you nations in verse 18. And know you congregation. He's addressing Israel here. This is the prophet, as you said earlier, Carlos. It's the prophet of lamentation and woe. It is. That's why I don't particularly like doing this, but it's very interesting at the same time. Hear earth. Hear everybody. Hear earth. Look, behold, watch this. I'm going to bring a disaster on this people. The fruit of their plans. They devised this. They are at fault. Because, here it is, they have not listened to my words. There in your margin goes Hebrews 5.9. You're going to use this all the time in your teaching. Salvation is given to those who hear the words of Jesus. I hope that's clear. Hebrews 5 verse 9. As for my Torah, my law, my instruction, they've rejected it. So have we rejected the new covenant? There are people out there listening this morning who think that old covenant, the Torah of Moses, is the same as the new covenant, the Torah of Messiah. That's absolutely false. The Torah of Messiah is the new covenant. For what purpose then all of this frankincense that they offered in, as prayer, all of that sweet smelling cane from a distant land, what's the point of all that? Your burnt offerings, says the prophet, are not acceptable. Your sweet smelling sacrifices are not pleasing to God. Therefore, and again you say, what's the therefore? Therefore, therefore, as a result of this terrible presentation of evil, this is what Yahweh says. I'm placing stumbling blocks. That's to say things to trip over stumbling blocks would be things that you trip over and cause you to fall. I'm putting these in front of you. You're going to fall over. And they will stumble against them. It's a very bad scene. Fathers and sons together, the whole family, neighbor and friend will perish. This is a fearful indictment and threat, which is part of the gospel of the kingdom. Repent, Jesus said, because the kingdom gospel, the day of God's wrath is approaching. What side of the fence are you on? Get straight before it's too late. Uh, we'll stop there yeah. anthony so yes, you can have you. more time to Fine. talk about the king of the north yes and we'll stop at verse 21 good point so yeah so you can uh, develop more on that next time we have yes. more time that'll be good thank you Alice. all right thanks anthony thanks for your commentary and reading there yes it's a very somber scenario here folks uh, but I, I was thinking this is like a bitter pill we have to swallow. <laughs> the prophets, uh, do the doom saying of the prophets, uh, we, we always like, of course, to hear good things and bright things, but 
we must uh, at times heed the prophet's warnings for ourselves too. Uh, judgment begins with us, remember, uh, with the house of God. So we must be aware of these things. Let's see, before we wrap it up, I do have a sermonette for you. And I think we have some time for it here. It's a little history lesson. And it is about the Council of Nicaea in 325 AD. And I hope you enjoy it. The Nicene Creed is an example of what happens when unbelievers like pagan philosophers and especially politicians like Roman emperors get mixed up in religion. First comes confusion since the creed itself is replete with ambiguous and contradictory language. For example, the creed violates the later Trinitarian formula of three distinct hypostases in one usia or three persons in one being or substance. According to the noted church historian Richard Hansen, for at least the first half of the period between 318 to 381 AD, and in some cases considerably later, usia and hypostasis are used as virtual synonyms. As a result, the creed condemned anyone who said the Son of God is of a different hypostasis or usia from the Father. Yet today, Trinitarians would charge you with blasphemy if you taught this section of their creed. Dr. Hansen added that not many who have written upon the subject of the creed have observed this serious difficulty presented by it. And in fact, there were present at the council people such as Marcellus of Ankira, who were quite ready to maintain that there is only one hypostasis in the Godhead and who were later to be deposed for heresy because they believed this. So, however Trinitarians today try to spin it, the creed produced by the Council was a mine of potential confusion and consequently most unlikely to be a means of ending the Arian controversy. Yet this confusion was not unique to those at Nicaea in 325 AD. Hundreds of years earlier, Tertullian wrote, there was a time when there was no sun. The historian J. D. Kelly found that Tertullian followed the apologists in dating the beginning of the sun to the Genesis creation, because prior to that moment, God could not strictly be said to have had a sun. A few years later, Origen described the sun both as having come into existence and as a creature at a period when nobody distinguished having come into existence from begotten. Yet Origen is known as the father of the so-called eternal generation of the Son. Secondly, many Christians think that the Trinity issue was completely resolved in 325 AD at Nicaea. This is far from the truth as the American church historian Yaroslav Pelikan explains. During those first three and a half centuries, the church was gradually drawing out the fuller implications of the creed. That process was by no means unilinear, but involved continual struggles to find the best words for speaking what was ultimately ineffable when articulating the faith of the church. The outcome of those struggles over language was highly complicated and often almost counterintuitive. Thirdly, a strong argument can be made for the fact that the creed is in reality a platonic creed. Church historians, like Dr. Hansen and others, have noted how words like hypostasis and usia were borrowed key terms from Platonism. Philo, the influential pagan figure of Christianity, himself described the three angelic visitors to Abraham of Genesis 18 not as three persons but as one and calls them God from God, light of light. William Inga, the famous professor of divinity, admitted that Platonism is part of the vital structure of Christian theology. Dr. Inga added that if Christians read Plotinus, who worked to reconcile Platonism with scripture, 
they would understand better the real continuity between the old culture and the new religion. And they might realize the utter impossibility of excising Platonism from Christianity without tearing Christianity to pieces. Therefore, early Christianity from its very beginning was formed by a confluence of Jewish and Hellenic religious ideas. Thus, another noted church historian, Will Durant, was right to say that Christianity did not destroy paganism, it adopted paganism. The Greek language, having reigned for centuries over philosophy, became the vehicle of Christian literature and ritual. Other pagan syncretists result from Egypt came the ideas of a divine trinity and the mystic theosophy that made Neoplatonism and Gnosticism and obscured the Christian creed. Christianity was the last great creation of the ancient pagan world. The fact is that the so-called Church Fathers' conception of the Trinity was a combination of Jewish monotheism and pagan polytheism except that to them this combination was a good combination. This according to Dr. Harry Wolfson, a history and philosopher professor at Harvard University in the 1950s. In fact, for the Church Fathers, this was an ideal combination of what is best in Jewish monotheism and of what is best in pagan polytheism. And consequently, these so-called Church Fathers gloried in it and pointed to it as evidence of their belief. Dr. Wolfson says that we have on this the testimony of one Gregory of Nyssa when he wrote that the truth passes in the mean between these two conceptions, destroying each heresy and yet accepting what is useful to it from each. The Jewish dogma is destroyed while the polytheistic error of the Greek school is made to vanish by the unity of the nature abrogating this imagination of plurality. And John of Damascus, the last of the church fathers wrote that on the one hand of the Jewish idea, we have the unity of God's nature. And on the other of the Greek, we have the distinction of hypostasis. Lastly, the Nicene Creed paved the bloody road that led to state-sponsored anti-Semitic quote-unquote Christian laws such as the Theodosian Code and the later Code of Justinian, which eventually banned the Creed of Jesus himself, the Shema of Mark 12, verse 29. The noted American rabbi and Jewish historian Abraham Milgram wrote that the Jews' vociferous recitation of the Shema at each morning and evening service was, the church felt, a deliberate challenge to the Christian dogma of the Trinity. The Emperor Justinian thus struck at the heart of Jewish worship and the Jews were only allowed to recite religious poems devoted to the praise of God, such as the Kedusha. The latter was condoned because Christians saw in the threefold sanctification of God, holy, 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 is the Lord of hosts, a hint of the Trinity. The Cambridge History of Judaism adds that during the Byzantine period, guards were sent to the synagogue to prevent recitations that were, quote, thought to impugn, if only implicitly, the Christian notion of the Trinity. This Roman legislation set the stage for the barbaric Catholic inquisitions of later centuries and the genocidal religious wars of the, quote, Christian Crusades. These conflicts have resulted in what some historians estimate to be the death of almost one billion people since the birth of Christ. According to Eusebius' History of the Church, after the council at Nicaea, Emperor Constantine wrote this to a church at Alexandria. What the 300 bishops have decided is nothing else than the decree of God for the Holy Spirit present in these men made known the will of God. These words by Emperor Constantine ring hollow indeed as we look back to the utter theological confusion and bloody devastation the Nicene Creed has unleashed upon an already evil 
age. I hope you enjoyed that. And if you'd like to read uh, that presentation, I posted the article and with the quotes on the humanjesus.org website, the dark legacy of the Nicene Creed. You know, as I was doing this latest sermonette, uh, I was thinking maybe I'm going too far in my, uh, you know, too far in my uh, appraisal of Nicaea and its repercussions, but I don't think so. You know, the, these are undis indisputable facts and uh, very hard indeed to see how it is not connected. Everything is connected. So it's a sad history, the, the early so-called Trinitarian history. So there it is. And exposed by their own scholars, exposed by their own so-called church fathers. So it's rather sad. Okay, before we go, let's end with some, on a good note, let's go to some comments we get during the weeks. Um, laws for thee, but not for me. The sermonette last Sunday, I believe, Lori said, very nice presentation, Carlos, with lots of scripture. Sorry, thank you for putting this together. Thank you, Lori, for watching. On my debate with Matt Slick, um, Matt Slick, I'm here to debate a topic with you, but first let me lay down some ground rules, okay? Rule number one, if in advance you do not affirm to my assertions and play by my rules, I'm going to take my Bible and go home. Rule number two, in the end, if you do not believe the way I believe, may you burn in hell for all eternity. <laughs> Oh, this is funny from uh, DJ. Thank you there, DJ, for watching. Uh, on the video by Anthony on Matthew 24, 34, thanks for this explanation. That makes a lot of sense. The JWs misinterpreted this verse to fool their poor followers that the end was imminent. They therefore had to resort to embarrassing to an embarrassing U-turn when the end did not come. Thanks, Anthony. Remain blessed. Thanks for watching there, David. From my brother and my real flesh and blood brother in Sydney. Thanks, my bro. I know I keep saying it, but really appreciate all the hard work you all do. Many blessings, much love, really good studies. Well, thanks, bro. Really means a lot. Kirk says on my, I think this was my last debate on the Nicene Creed. Uh, did Dr. Branson ever state what he considers scripture? Did he define scripture in his view? I felt like he was keeping his definition of quote, scripture ambiguous as a sort of gotcha card so that he could muddy the waters and argue against sola scriptura, scripture alone. But maybe I missed his definition if he gave one. Thanks there, Kirk. On the video, did they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom? I was searching for this answer. Thank you. Well, thanks for watching, and I'm glad you got your answer. On the video, Trinitarian Catholic monk and Protestant scholars say Jesus is not God. Awesome video, Brother Carlos. I appreciate your time and effort in putting it together as well as all your work, peace and blessings. Well, thank you so much. It's very sweet from everyone. And just a note here, we will be doing Q&A this Friday. So I'll put up the link soon. <clears throat> By the way, to get our alerts when we're live streaming or we have events, Please subscribe to the YouTube channel, Focus on the Kingdom. If not, send me your questions, your emails. There's the email, carlos at thehumanjesus.org. So we'll do, we do it once a month now, Q&A with Sir Anthony. So it will be this Friday, which is September 16. So mark that down. And if you have any other questions, you cannot watch live and ask them, please feel free to email me. Keep your questions short and succinct. 
All right, so let's close with prayer. Once again, thanks everyone for watching. Thank you, uh, as always, to Anthony for his time and efforts. And let us pray. Father, we thank you for this time, the technology. Um, we thank you for the, the peace in this country we live in, the luxury of this country and countries like this. Uh, we pray for the leaders to be uh, mindful and keep the peace in society so we can continue doing the work God has given us to do. We pray for uh, the president and all the people in, in, the, in politics, as we are told to do, that they may leave us alone and in peace so we can preach the gospel about the coming kingdom. We thank you for this incredible prophet Jeremiah and all those incredible men and women who suffered and some of them died a brutal death. We pray for our listeners. We thank you for their, they, their being here. We pray for the um, Maurizio family, which has had our guest here from Peru and their churches, and that they may be safe during this time. And we thank you once again for the youth lessons and the teachers, Tracy, Sarah, Barbara, Michelle, um, we thank you for their lessons and that golden rule of loving our neighbors and loving our enemies, which is very tough. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless everyone until we meet again.